Hi, and welcome to episode four of Learn English with Amy, the podcast that helps you listen and learn more. This episode in particular is ideal for advanced English learners, especially those of you who are preparing for postgraduate studies, and those of you with school-aged children. The theme of this episode is cracking the code. I'll talk more about this in a minute, but first I want to introduce or reintroduce my guest, who I also spoke with in episode three, Lynn Carpenter. Lynn works at the Churchill School and Center, a school in New York City for children with language-based learning disabilities, such as dyslexia. She heads up teaching support at the school and is the director of the Churchill Center. Here's Lynn talking about her work. I work at a school for students with language-based learning disabilities. Um, That's for students who are like that age five through their senior year of high school. Those were 18 years old, heading off to college. And I was a reading specialist for years. So I work with kids who had trouble learning how to read because they're dyslexic. And now I do professional development for all the teachers and I also do a lot of parent programming. And I help run a program called the Reading Initiative where we just provide free tutoring to kids at schools where they don't really get great reading instruction. And also start, we're starting to do more like parent workshops. I'm doing something for like a housing project in a, in a week, um, just helping parents know what to do for their kids at home, which is nice. So this is all through Churchill? Yeah, because I run the center. So it's the Churchill School and Center, and it's the Center for Professional Development and Parent Engagement. We've always run a free tutoring program out of there. And one thing that came out of COVID was that we realized we could take it virtual, which is what we did, but now we can actually do things for more people who wouldn't be able to necessarily get to Churchill. So like I helped organize over the summer, some teachers were doing free tutoring for a, a school in Philadelphia, which is a, like from a rough neighborhood where a lot of the kids are homeless. And so now I'm actually next week doing something for a housing authority organization and that they're putting on for their tenants. Okay, so what does it mean to crack the code? Where does it come from? And what does it have to do with Lynn and teaching reading? Crack the code is an idiom that means to figure out how to do something, often something very difficult, to solve a difficult problem or mystery. During the Second World War, military messages were encoded, that is, written in secret code, to enable secure communications among the troops. Now, code writing had been done for many years, but by this point it had become much more sophisticated and complex, so solving or cracking codes was now a very difficult task. People who solved codes became known as code breakers, and they were essential for enabling communications with the front lines. The formal term for cracking the code is decoding. Decoding is also a term used by reading specialists, like Lynn. Here's Lynn explaining what decoding skills are. It means word attack. So your ability to like sound out a word, break out a word. What do you do when you get a word you don't know? You're not supposed to guess. You're supposed to know enough about the sounds and the words to be able to decode it. So understanding letter sound correspondence, which is the alphabetic principle. So how is decoding taught? How should it be taught? And also, how is it that even well-off children who attend private schools in Manhattan can get all the way to university and still not be good readers? Lynn will speak to all of these points in a minute. But before we dive in, I need to provide some context on reading instruction that Lynn will reference, and that is the science of reading. There's a lot behind this, so I will just share the key points. I should note also that the focus here is on the United States only, and the background information I'll provide is based on the work of a terrific journalist called Emily Hanford, who works with APM Reports, or American Public Media. I'll include links to her work in the episode notes. So what is the science of reading? Well, as the name suggests, it refers to an approach to teaching reading that's scientific, proven through research to be effective. The science of reading is based on a vast body of research conducted over the last 20 plus years by reading experts and cognitive scientists. It recognizes that our brains aren't actually wired for reading. So learning to read isn't something that comes naturally, like for instance, the way a young child acquires spoken language. The science states that teachers must provide explicit instruction, clear and direct guidance. The main component of the scientific approach is phonics, teaching children to begin reading by breaking down words into individual sounds. And that massive body of research and knowledge, it also debunked or discredited older methods of teaching reading that were based on tradition and observation, but not on evidence. The main one was known as the whole language approach. 
To cut a long story short, this approach assumes that children can learn to read if they are read books, surrounded by books, and taught strategies to basically guess at words. For instance, through context and looking at pictures. But guess what? Millions of children in the U.S. alone are still taught to read using this disproven method. And guess what else? According to Emily Hanford, a shocking number of children in the U.S. can't read well. More than a third of all fourth graders can't read at a basic level. And most students still are not proficient readers by the time they finish high school. These stats, or statistics, are from a standardized reading test in the U.S. called the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP for short. As we all know, reading is an essential skill for school and in life. But according to Hanford, who documents the situation in the U.S., when kids struggle to learn how to read, it can lead to a downward spiral. Their vocabulary and knowledge don't improve. They fall further and further behind. They can suffer from depression, anxiety, feelings of isolation. They often act out. That is, they have behavioral issues. They're far more likely to drop out of high school and far more likely to end up in the criminal justice system. And what about children with dyslexia, the reading disability that affects areas of the brain that process language and cause difficulty with decoding? A disability that has no effect on a person's level of intelligence. It's estimated that between 5 and 12 percent of all children in the U.S. have dyslexia, yet only 4.5 percent are even diagnosed. As Hanford explains in her work, the science of reading suggests that if all children were taught to read using approaches that work for students with dyslexia, then reading achievement would improve overall. And finally, the science clearly demonstrates when children can't read, it's usually because they haven't been taught how to do it. They haven't been taught how to crack the code of reading. Okay, so back to Lynn finally. First, I ask her how the U.S. compares with other countries in terms of reading, and also how teaching reading is similar to teaching a language. But the U.S., at the very least, the NAEP scores, there's like a countries are compared to each other. The U.S. is bad. It's low. It's always been low. And it shouldn't be as low for a developed country, right. like considering all the resources and everything. And it's because of how reading's taught in the country. And some of the ways it's similar is to how people do English as a second language, because it's a lot about explicit instruction and direct instruction when you're thinking about how you have to break things down for people and explain vocabulary and all that kind of stuff and give them like very specific strategies. So kids with reading delays who have like who are dyslexic, what ends up happening is that their vocabulary doesn't develop at the same rate as kids who are reading often. So it's called the Matthew effect. It's like the idea that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer is that kids sort of start off in the same place. But if you're not reading very much, you're not getting the vocabulary. And so you, there's so many words that people assume you know that you don't actually know the meaning of. And so that happens a lot. So in teaching, it's called like tier two words, where it's like words that aren't as basic as like hat and hand, you know what I mean? But like that you would actually need to know that are relevant to your life. Like, um, what would be a good word? Word like deceive, you know, like you don't need to know deceive in life, but like, you know, it's not something you're going to learn in kindergarten, but it's a fairly common word, right? Or some words you would just see in the newspaper where it's like, it's not stuff you would learn right when you were really young, but a lot of words we just sort of pick up because you read so much and you're, and you're exposed to so much language. But if you have a language disorder and a reading disorder, which you can have both, you know, and it's impacting your ability to take in these words, then kids need a lot of direct instruction because they're, they just don't know. So before you teach a book um, or, you know, go over content in a class, you have to sort of preview words and, and talk about what they mean. So it's similar in that way. And also the way you kind of, and pacing. So much, I think, for teaching is, is all about pacing. And then just having a practice. So like, I know you'll do something like conversational kind of a thing. And for reading strategies, like you just have to start reading and applying your strategies, which is similar, I think, in the way that you just have to start talking and just immersing yourself in a language. It's just, you have to just kind of put yourself in it. Do you think that private schools are better or worse at assessing language? A very good question. Oftentimes they're worse. The thing is, it's so much more dependent on the actual school. And if you're in public school, there's a whole process. Your teacher refers you, like your teacher might flag you. If you're in a school where you've got a good teacher who's aware and and they're noticing you're falling behind, then there's a whole evaluation process you have to go through. If you're in private school, might suggest you get a tutor. 
They might also not be teaching reading the same way you're supposed to. It's like the whole idea of the science of reading, like explicit instruction. You're not necessarily likely to see that if you're in like a progressive private school.